Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. IKEA always asks, what makes a house a home? Comfort? Making your place your own? Mm. Affordable solutions created with the planet in mind? With IKEA, it's all of the above. And now you can afford even more with new benefits for IKEA family members, including 5% off on all eligible purchases in store. Every visit, every day. Visit ikea-usa.com slash family to learn more and join. Offer valid starting 9 one Limited to qualifying purchases. Exclusions apply. Not valid on services. Discount applied in store only before tax, shipping, and handling. Cannot be combined with coupons. Visit ikea-usa.com slash family for more details. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi, I'm Christopher Kimball, host of Milk Street Radio. If you'd like to change the way you cook and also think about food, please check out the Milk Street podcast. We travel around the world to find pizza in Tokyo, Egyptian food in Berlin, and Bhutanese farmers in Vermont. We speak to Jamie Oliver, Rachel Ray, Al Roker, Ina Garten, as well as Michael Twitty, Marcus Samuelson, and Alice Waters. And we'll introduce you to recipes that will change the way you cook, from bright pink Tottenham cake to Afghan dumplings to shoyu sugar steak, and that one is direct from Hawaii. It's a whole new world of food right here on Milk Street Radio. Please check us out on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts, or go to 177milkstreet.com. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. Fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles 102.3 FM Riverside and 1050 AM Palm Springs Welcome back into the House of Mystery and I'm Al Warren sitting at the controls and the other side of the country we've got the great and only David Rose Martino <laughs> you, still, you still got the rose thing in there, right? <laughs> well, people people tend to tend to like that, so oh. you, know, you know, let's just stick with Rosie. Rosie, Rose. I would call you Marty, head. but nobody nobody likes that. So. Marty, Marty. That's very Marty old. from Boston. <laughs> yeah, see, that's what I mean. I was just thinking, you know, that would work, but yeah, nobody likes it. So. They don't like it. No, people are mean. Uh. They are. Yeah, turn, yeah, they turned into something awful. <laughs> it's not Marty when it's finished. It becomes something really bad. So we can't say that on air anyway. But um, so now today, I think it's the first author that we've got from Pegasus. No, actually, it would be the second because, you know, John Copenhagen yeah. is one from Pegasus. Oh, I don't know if you knew that, but he's from a different division, but he's written for uh, for them as well, and his second oh. book is through them, so That's all right. kind of a coincidence, but this is our first non-John. <laughs> non-John. <laughs> so um, what, who have we got sitting on the line all the way from Scotland uh, in his home, ready to have his haggis and talk about his new book? We've got uh, Robert J. Harris. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, Robert J. Harris is my authorial name, but people just call me Bob normally. So you yeah. can do that. You're well, special type. Yeah, well, you know, I don't, don't want to be too personal there right away. <laughs> but now your book is A Study in Crimson, Sherlock Holmes, 1942. Um, so very interesting uh, take on Sherlock Holmes. What got you into writing this book? Like, why did you go into uh, doing a crime book and with Sherlock Holmes? Well, it, it's a bit of a departure. I mean, I, I start off, my first books I wrote were um, teen novels that I wrote with my friend Jane Yolen um, some years back. Uh, in my solo career, I wrote a couple of teen historical adventure stories. Then um, I was writing, uh, I guess, middle grade novels. I did a series of comic fantasies set here in St. Andrews. 
and um, then followed that with the, the next idea I had was to write, well, some, some stories about the young Arthur Conan Doyle, it says schoolboy days, his early teens, and the idea would be, there's only one of them originally I'd worked out, so I wrote a novel about, you know, young Leonardo da Vinci, one about young, um, well, Shakespeare, so that Conan Doyle is going to be a third in this kind of series of young legends, and um, so being Conan Doyle, I thought, well, there's another adventure in, in Victorian Edinburgh, which will sort of lay the groundwork for the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes in later years. But um, my publisher at that point, they they, 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 they said, actually, this would be a great series because you write more than just the one, which gave me a set of freedom. So I've written three of those. It's called The Arthur Conan Doyle Mystery, um, in which the young Arthur Conan Doyle in Victorian Edinburgh has to solve the mysteries of uh, grave robbing and sabotaging the magician back. And in the third book, uh, uh, there's a mysterious invisible thief who's uh, robbing jewels around, around the town. And in the course of writing these, of course, it crossed my mind. I was trying to make make mysteries worthy of Sherlock Holmes um, to make it, get that out of the story. And that made me think, of course, about maybe writing a Sherlock Holmes novel. Um, the problem with that is there are actually an awful lot of Sherlock Holmes petitions out there. I, mean, I, I barely read a fraction of them. Um, but uh, by, once I started looking on my Kindle, I realized that people who've written like 20, and, and most of them are you know, trying to recreate kind of Victorian adventure with greater or lesser success. Um, and then there's spin-off things with Moriarty and the Strad and stuff like that. And so I thought, well, if I were another Sherlock Holmes novel, nobody would pay it. They would get no attention at all. Uh, and then one day, my eye uh, lighted upon my box DVD set of the Battle Rathbone Sherlock Holmes film. The first two, which are set in Victorian times, Fox Pictures made those, The Hounds of the Baskervilles, and then The Adventure of Sherlock Holmes. Then they dropped the whole thing. They weren't going to keep them going. I guess they figured there weren't enough good stories uh, available to keep it going. And Universal Pictures stepped in and they, they said, well, we'd like to take this up. Um, and they made a deal with the, the Doyle estate. He died in 1930. So the stories are all under copyright because his family still owned the rights to all this. They couldn't make films of them without actually making a deal with them. And they agreed with Universal's ideas to, to kind of refresh the whole thing by updating it to the 1940s. Um, for various reasons, um, but um, one of which, of course, was this, like, you know, during the war, and Sherlock Holmes was a great champion for, uh, for the League of Great Britain at that time. Um, and so the Rathbone and Bruce, Michael Bruce and Dr. Watson, who played one of his first two Victorian films, also were starring in a very popular radio series as Holmes and Watson, set in Victorian time, were very well established. So now, when they actually made the first of these films, Sherlock Holmes and the Voice of Terror, the transition seemed very, very smooth. I mean, watching them again years later, before any thought came to me to make a novel out of them, I was always struck how easily they just moved into 1940s. Suddenly, you know, you've got aeroplanes and cars, but still Sherlock Holmes, still, you know, Baker Street looks much the same. Um, and uh, so I, I, I was thinking about this, and I, the idea came to me, well, nobody's ever thought to take that version of Sherlock Holmes. It's very well established. There were 12 of the Universal Picture series, and, um, you know, they're always on television and, I grew up on them, and other people did. I thought, well, no one's ever thought to write a novel taking this version of Sherlock Holmes. So I thought, that could work really well, because you've got the template here. You've only got these films, which, which really do uh, remain loyal to Conan Doyle while updating the thing for the 40s. You've got the great wartime background. And I thought, well, yeah, that, 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 that could work. That would be like a Sherlock Holmes novel. That's something a bit different. It wouldn't be trying to redo uh, old versions of Sherlock Holmes. It would be actually something that would be new to physics. I've never been done on a novel before. Um, and so I, I took the, I printed up the basic idea, the picture of, uh, Rathbone and Bruce and a title and just the basic blurb for the idea of it. I went to my, uh, agent and my, my editor in Edinburgh, who did already published my two Richard Panny books. So I'm, I'm going to be talking an awful lot and I think I've written two period adventure novels set in the early part of the last century, uh, reviving John Buchan's, um, the hero from the 39th set. Panic. And they were very happy with those I'd done. So I sent them with this idea for Sherlock Holmes. My editor uh, just said to me, do this next and do three of them. So uh, they were quite enthused with just the basic idea. Um, it took a few weeks more before the idea came of uh, the plot of it. Once I got that, though, it really took off and all seemed to fit together really well. So that's as briefly as I can do it, how I came to write the book. Don't you feel a great amount of pressure writing about um, a classic 
um, like Sherlock Holmes? Like, don't you feel like there's there's going to be people that automatically don't like what you do because of it and others that love it and all that? Do, you know, isn't there a great amount of pressure just in the character itself? Well, I've kind of done that thing with the not-so-famous Richard Hani um, from John Buchan's novels. Um, he wrote five novels about Richard Hani, and I carried the adventure on into, into the, the Second World War. I don't think it's too much length about that. And... Um, Mostly, uh, yeah, the great majority got great reviews and uh, people who love Buchan's books wrote to me and I met them in person and they said how great it is how these characters back of them. Um, but there's always a few dissenting voices and we might say, well, this is like sacred stuff, you shouldn't touch this. But that, but not people are entitled to that. So I, I had a notion that maybe people would, would not take the World War II Sherlock Holmes. I wanted to be very clear on the cover of books with my, uh, my, my book editor. So I've got you on the, on the cover. It's got to say, this is inspired by the, the 1940s film series. But I don't want anybody to think, who is this guy? He's somebody thinks he can stick Sherlock Holmes in World War II. Well, it was a ludicrous idea. I want to make it clear that I didn't come up with this because I thought it'd be a great guy, but a great thing for me. So, um, uh, and I feel that, that that version of Holmes is quite well established. So, um, uh, pressure, well, there's a pressure in it, yeah, but that just makes you work hard to get it right. So I was rereading, rereading, already been rereading re- re- the Conan Doyle story for my um, end, middle grade series, the Anthony Doyle mystery. So I was carrying on reading those. So I was getting a really good feel for Dr. Watson's narrative voice and what the characters were like. And so in the course of writing this, uh, I was rereading again and um, also watching the films. And I think those films do a great job of, of transposing Holmes and Watson into the 1940s. And um, so I think I, I just I absorbed all that. And... Um, I found it was, it was actually really, really enjoyable to do, to, to, to get into that setting and get into those characters. Um, and, you know, uh, yes, it, it, it's hard work, but it was very pleasurable work. I would mean, read a chapter back and think, that's really come off well. That, that really reads like a proper Sherlock Holmes story. You know, they've got telephones and they're flying in a, an RAF plane and stuff like that. It all, it all works out really well. Um, part of the thing with the book was, because I, I, I was aware that it was a bit of a transition, People who wouldn't be familiar with the films, and we think, what is this? This is, this is really strange. This should, you should have Sherlock Holmes in this period. So the first three chapters of the book are actually kind of a short story. It's a, a locked room mystery in the Scottish castle, where Sherlock Holmes is flown up there to investigate the disappearance of a scientist from the locked room. I thought we'll have this, this little kind of classic kind of mystery first, and that will bring Holmes and Watson to the forefront, reintroduce the, the, the to the readers. Um, so they'll feel familiar. They'll feel, yeah, this is Holmes and Watson. This is this, where we get into the, into the more unusual story. And by, so by the time they come back to London and have to take on these killings, like the, the readers who are not already familiar with that setting of Sherlock Holmes would have they kind of segued into it. They'd have a sense of comfort with the character in this new thing. And, um, and it, would, it would go well. So uh, the reaction I've had, the reviews and uh, feedback from readers, seems to have been a great success, which I, I'm, I'm really happy about. Because what I want to do is for people to, to really love reading the books and enjoy them and, and get a great sense of joy out of them, which like I, I get from watching the films and reading Conan Doyle. Well, Crimson Jack. Now, who is Crimson Jack, and how do you come up with a, with a character like that? Well, um, I had a had a, just a throwaway plot that I, that I took on the blurb, the, the presentation of my editor. Um, but then I was reading through a book uh, called The World of Sherlock Holmes, which is one of those Sherlockian books, so you pretend that Sherlock Holmes was real, and you sort of discuss what his life would have been like and what he encountered. And I got to a chapter on um, Jack the Ripper. Now, Jack the Ripper and Sherlock Holmes have faced each other a few times in Victorian times, in novels and in, and in films. Um, and I suddenly thought, oh, you had this idea of a 1942 story set in the same year as the, the Universal series began. And I suddenly thought, well, supposing somebody is murdering women on the same date, as Jack the Ripper, and he leaves a signature behind as Crimson Jack. Then Crimson Jack came to be very quickly, which is a very natural variant on Jack the Ripper. Um, the weird thing was that after I, I, had a, I spent a couple of hours trying to think of a title for the book, uh, uh, and then when I, I thought, going back to the original titles of the book, the first Sherlock Holmes novel is A Study in Scarlet, and because I had Crimson Jack, it seemed to just obviously fall into place. So uh, I can't say too much about Crimson Jack because the identity of Crimson Jack is the central mystery of the whole book of who he is and why he's committing these murders. Uh, so, uh, um, but yeah, ha- having one of the great things having a kind of ripper style murders was even though we're in London, 1942, 
um, it's got that Victorian vibe. This is, this is a kind of a, a new version of, of the, the most famous pillar of Victorian London. And instead of having the, the Victorian fog, you know, the blackout because of the German bombing, um, London blacked out, all these dark, and the light shining anywhere. So obviously, it was a great hotbed for crime at the time. And so this killer is shrouded in darkness of the blackout rather than the fog. Um, and so it, 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 the, whole, the two things seem to come together really, really well. Um, and so you've got, in a sense, that, that kind of creepy, gothic feel of Jack the Ripper. At the same time, you've got the war raging and all the, the, the blackout and other aspects of uh, wartime London. So how much time does that take to uh, research a time like that? So, you, you know, you're covering it during the war, and um, because you have to make sure everything in the story is correct to time. Um, does that take a lot of your time? Well, there's two aspects to that. One was that I'd already written this novel, The 31 Kings, a Japani novel set in 1940, which is, I'd written a, a wartime novel. And also in a screenplay um, based on somebody else's novel set during the war. So I'd done a couple of things. I'd, I'd researched that period already because of that. Um, and watching the films, of course, could do that. That, that was a source for how, how Sherlock Holmes functions in that. I'd obviously I've got a very good friend, her name's Kirsten Nichol, and um, she always insists I mention her. <laughs> but uh, it's quite right, too, because she, she's, she has genealogy, she's got a degree in, in art history, she's very interested in all sorts of uh, minutia. And she's accessed all sorts of online resources. So um, if I'm having trouble getting some information about something, I, I will just email her. And within an hour, she'll, she'll dot it. You know, I'll say, well, what, 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 would, what sort of meal would you be having at this time of day? And she would know everything they could have under rationing, and all things they couldn't have. Um, things that would take me a long time to find out. And I've got to go about the book. Uh, also, other things about my um, other aspects of the book were I wanted to cover Sherlock Holmes. What did he play on the violin in 1942? Well, I've got a big friend, Dr. Toby Lipman, who is a retired doctor uh, and a violinist, a very good violinist. So he actually gave me medical advice when I asked questions about that. And also, when I wanted to talk about music, he gave me a lot of good. good uh, information for Sherlock Holmes and that. So basically, it, it's, you, you do as much research as you can yourself. Um, but if you know people who can help you out, that's always great. They, they know things that you don't. Uh, and so the book was read over by my friend Kirsty to, to check it for any possible problems or flaws. And so that's most of my books now. And if she points out something that's perhaps a little unhistorical, I just think, well, does it need to be that way to make the story work? I mean, if you're, if you're bending things a little bit to make up the story, I think that's permissible, as long as you know you're doing it. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are certain things that I I either had for books to write, but I thought the, the amount of research involved would be crippling. I would think they couldn't do it. So, um, uh, yeah, so, it, and it's, of course, you find out interesting things. I mean, there were, there was a point in the book where there was a typewritten note that Holmes has analysed. And, um, and so I, I went into that to discover that, in fact, you can, in fact, uh, work out exactly the kind of typewriter that was used. And if any type of note, there are, in fact, the whole studies in this and systems of doing it. And this led me to uh, the name of Ordway Hilton, who'd been doing this for the Chicago Police Department and their science department. And he was a document specialist. So Holmes caught him and he's using Ordway Hilton's method to analyze this type note they've got. And so finding out all about this, how this all works, how you analyze these things was interesting. And I found that out by myself and uh, put that in. Um, so yeah, the, the, it's, it's part of the enjoyment of doing something. Um, but you miss, and you do just want to make sure you've not made a big mistake. So uh, I do have a fact checker who goes through it for me, and um, I have some good editors too, and a publisher who will pick up things if I've got something wrong, which hasn't been too much so far. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's it's something when I'm aware of. It doesn't, it doesn't feel burdensome. You know, it's a matter of making it an authenticity without beating people to death with your research. You don't spend pages describing wartime London or exactly how things were. That kind of, there's a story to be told and bringing in the things that are relevant to the story. Is what's important. I was wondering how you keep track of um, your storylines and your characters. Do you have tools, um, a process, any methods for doing that? Uh, well, I I, uh, I do do a list of all the characters and type up what I know about them and what. Of course, some of them are like Sherlock Holmes and Watson are um, not my creations. But the thing with this particular version of Sherlock Holmes, of course, is that Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson in this story can't be exactly the same as Victorian Holmes and Watson. Um, you know, the, the original Sherlock Holmes is at the end of his career uh, on the brink, on the edge of uh, World War One, his last adventure, his final bow, 
take place just before the outbreak of, of Russia World War, when he's probably about 60. Now, in my story, the Eugene Watson in the late 40s, early 50s, um, in 1942. So this meant there were young men in the First World War. So uh, I had to construct a different timeline for them. But they had to be the same people. They had to, they had to end up being the Conan Doyle character, but by a different route. It's like if I'm, uh, if I'm in Scotland and I, I want to take a train um, from Edinburgh to Aberdeen, I can either go via Dundee or I can go via Perth. So a different route, but when you get to the end, you're still in, in Aberdeen. So this is, the idea of this was to follow, the, to create the new timeline for these characters, um, but have them end up being the same men. Um, and perhaps have a deeper explanation of why they're like that. Um, there's a background to both of them that, that, that comes in this story. And of course, it, 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 it's a heavy responsibility to keep them authentically Holmes and Watson while set in a different time period and with some different life experiences. Um, uh, but at the same time, it gives you certain freedom to explore it. So one of the things I did with that was to take elements of the actors um, back to the last one in Nigel Bruce. I made the, the, the cast in the group um, the same age as the actors were. And they both served in the First World War. Um, Michael Rathbone uh, was the captain of a scout unit, um, uh, with the Liverpool Scottish, and uh, his autobiography begins with a very harrowing adventure running across no man's land being uh, shot at by the Germans. Uh, Nigel Bruce was shot in both legs in Belgium uh, by German machine gun fire. Um, and he was honorably discharged with injuries, but he, he uh, joined the army again and became an officer in a training camp. So these guys weren't just some sort of wet actors who've never done any proper work in their life, who really stare death in the face. And so I, I took some of that and put it into the DVD. So my homes in Watson also served in the First World War in very different ways. Um, and Watson is wounded the same way Nigel Bruce was. So the, the, the constructing of that timeline was um, quite, that was something I had to, had to map out. I, I had to take the, I, I, I thought the various um, versions of the original Sherlock Holmes timeline that Sherlock Holmes did, I took that. And then I do my paralleling one of my own timeline, um, starting much later. And I just had to write that up. Then there was, uh, having a, a timeline of, of the events in the war, so much of the war at the time. Then there was, I had a calendar of the days of the mystery. You know, just have that, because the dates of the murders are very important. I have that and what's happening in between and where, where it all ends up. So there are various timetables and background notes on the characters. Um, uh, that, and I, I, I Yes, I just keep track of it. Uh, I don't do any of software things, I just type up a lot of stuff. And, uh, but once you've written something down, it tends to stick in your mind. Um, but I would check something occasionally. And I always have a, a list of all the characters in the book that I add to, that I add characters to the book and make little notes about them. Um, so, so, yeah. It, 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 it. We at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. IKEA always asks, what makes a house a home? Comfort? Making your place your own? Mm. Affordable solutions created with the planet in mind? With IKEA, it's all of the above. And now you can afford even more with new benefits for IKEA family members, including 5% off on all eligible purchases in store. Every visit, every day. Visit ikea-usa.com slash family to learn more and join. Offer valid starting 9-1-2022. Limited to qualifying purchases. Exclusions apply. Not valid on services. Discount applied in store only before tax, shipping, and handling. Cannot be combined with coupons. Visit ikea-usa.com slash family for more details. I don't just keep it all in my head all the time. I mean, that's clever enough for that. So I have lots of notes um, on my computer that I can, I can check up on to make sure I'm keeping things consistent and that, that, that it all makes sense. That, you know, something that, that should take three days doesn't happen in the space of an hour. Like that. Well, do you have a subtext? Do you have a meaning? Do you have something that you hope people get from the book other than the story itself? I think, 
we did a writing this kind of period adventures, like a Richard Hannay book and this, this book and its sequel that I finished recently. Um, there are, against the background of war, a lot of things are, are, are magnified, you know, questions of honor and uh, justice. So there's a great theme of justice in this book. Um, Holmes talks about justice and uh, the novel split into three parts. The first part is called um, Deduction, the second part is called Investigation, and the third part is called Justice. So there are certain, I suppose, philosophical questions regarding the nature of justice that run through it. Um, but th that is kind of a subtext. And I would think by the end of the book, uh, we just might be looking at it and have a few thoughts about, about that. You know, um, 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 uh, so, uh, but it, in a sense, you don't want to hammer on too much about, about stuff. I think, I think the great thing that I think the, the, the sense of what these men have been through in the experiences in wartime, Dr. Watson also we go into his, his grief of the death of his wife some years earlier. Um, you know, Watson is widowed in Conan Doyle stories, but not very much is made of that. So I, I make, make a bit more of that in this book. I have Watson reflect about a moving and death of his wife. So there's kind of thematics and there's kind of emotional resonances to it that I hope people will take away from it and really enjoy um, getting a, an emotional sense from the characters. Um, late in the book, Sherlock Holmes is sort of sent to Watson, um, one of the experiences in, in the Great War, in the First World War, that to a large extent, it's more than his career made than the man he is. Um, and I think that that's a strong story and very moving. Uh, and so I think those, those are the things at the end of all that people will have. No, it's not just a romp, it's not just a lark, kind of bit of fun. Uh, there's actually a lot of depth to it emotionally and thematically. Um, uh, by the end of it, we'll stay with people as well as the, the happy glow of having enjoyed a really, really exciting and intriguing story. I read that you're a fencer, and I'm just wondering if, uh, if you've ever had the opportunity to uh, uh, use that in any of your novels or short fiction. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I, I haven't done it for a while because my knee's gone, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, probably because of the fencing. But yeah, uh, in, 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 I do mention in this book that, that Holmes is on the Cambridge fencing team at the university. So, where Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes is an expert boxer, um, which is one of the interesting aspects of him as a character, which is actually very athletic. Uh, I kind of thought a later version of Holmes, making him a, making him a still defensor, would, would be good. So, um, I have recently completed all the editing on the second of my Sherlock Holmes novel, which is The Devil's Blade, Sherlock Holmes, 1943, which, um, brings into the Moriarty, and Colonel Sebastian Moran, his, his Mariotta's henchman. And there is, in fact, um, in the first part of the book, a pretty exciting fencing match between Sherlock Holmes and, uh, and Colonel Sebastian Moran. And my wife, my wife is the first editor of my book. She, she's the first person to read the book and edits them ruthlessly and cruelly and tells me anything that's just not good enough and makes me work harder to make them really good. And when she read that, she said, that's really good. You, you can tell you, you have fenced because you know how it all works. Um, and this is a, it's supposedly a sporting thing with the two of them. The, the swords have got, you know, covers on them, so you can't stab somebody with it. But I, I having fenced um, some rather wild fencing matches, even with some guarded blades, you can get pretty seriously bruised uh, doing those. Um, a friend and I were fencing, we were actually warned by the president match to, to tone it down, we were being too, too vicious. So you can do a pretty, pretty violent fencing match, even when it's not, not to the death. So I'm very pleased that that came out and I got the chance to, to use some of that knowledge uh, in the story and to present Holmes as a really good fencer. Um, so yeah, I, I did get to use that. And, uh, and I think it, also because Basil, Basil Rathbone was actually an expert fencer. He was twice an army fencing champion. And um, recently we were watching the Mark of Zorro where he fences her own power and Rathbone is the villain. It's one of the greatest fencing matches in any film ever. And but they can do that because Rathbone himself is, is so good at it. Um, and he sent his robbery and other things around him. So that it was partly a, a, a tribute to, to that man to, to give Sherlock Holmes a tale and have him demonstrate it um, in a, an extended fencing match in the second uh, book of my Sherlock Holmes adventures. Um, I, I enjoyed that tremendously, being able to do that and then use that experience. So, yes, that, that did come into play. Um, one, of, one of my more, more physical talents, so I don't have that many practical talents, but um, that was one that came into play. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, with your wife being the editor, you probably have to fence. <laughs> yeah. Well, she, she fenced briefly, not as long as I did. Um, yeah, but she, well, she, she, she's a writer before me. That's inspired me to get into writing. She's a, a fancy adventure. She's got a whole series of books with Catherine Cup together. 
and um, and uh, then she was teaching creative writing and her own private editing business. So that uh, uh, her editing me is sometimes it's sometimes a tense experience. It can be quite tense <laughs> <laughs> sometimes <laughs> if we disagree over something. You know, that, that I said, "Well, no, it's fine the way it is." No, no, we have to change this. Um, but what it means is it gives me a content right when the, I finish the book at home and send off the publisher, I know it's in really good shape. Uh, and so uh, anything I back from publisher, there's never any need for things wrong with the book. There's only a little, little things he wants to, to polish or things like that a little bit. So uh, and that, that's nice to have that, that to, to know when the book goes out, that it's in really good shape, it's been worth all the, the suffering. And our marriage holds together very well. I mean, we're still, you know, uh, it's our 40th anniversary next year. So um, I think ultimately it strengthened it, the fact we, we do work together on things. Um, uh, you know, when she was writing, I, I, I kind of pitched in here and there, helping out with bits of that, not the editing. Um, and so we worked together on these things over the years, and I think it's been, been good for us to, to, to do that. And I guess we, I say, great confidence that, that I'm writing. Um, if, if there's something I've missed, something that I, I, I've maybe not hit the right note on, she'll read it and spot it and tell me what to do. And um, uh, yeah. and also she does quite a bit of research as well. She will research things while I'm writing, knowing what's coming up in the story. Um, so I think I've got a, kind of a, a researching team, which is a fantastic benefit to have. Um, not that we've got that. Mm. Uh, and so having this, this support network of, of family and friends is great. And uh, I, the everything I get from my publisher um, over here, from Berlin, Polygon, is very, very good. It's, 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 uh, but sometimes spotting things, I thought, gosh, I, I, was, I can spot that. So that's not quite correct. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a team effort, although, you know, I am writing this. I do the hard work about the writing it, which is both time consuming. I'll take, I'll have my name on the cover mm. of the book because I think I, I deserve that. <laughs> so, so your characters, where do you get all your characters from in the story? Like uh, the outskirt, the outside characters. Are they people you know, people you've seen somewhere? Um, where does that come from? I, I don't really base them on people I know mostly. Um, obviously, the hardcore of characters in this book, uh, there's Holmes, Watson, uh, Mrs. Hudson, Inspector Lestrade, Michael Holmes, or not, um, and Wiggins um, from the, the make it regulars, who's now a young man and, and a, a fire warden in, in London. Um, so all the other characters, of course, invented by me um, for the story. Uh, one of the one of the most important is um, Gail Gail Preston, who's an NBC radio reporter in London at the time, who becomes very much part of the whole investigation, and um, she's inspired by Helen Hyatt, who was a real radio reporter. At this time, she reported uh, a radio broadcast from while the war was in, in London and on the continent. Um, and she wrote a book about it, her experiences. So uh, this, she inspired that. I was looking for a strong female character, and I thought, well, yeah, an, an American woman in London working for NBC, that, 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 that's good. And she uh, has a very pivotal role to play in, in the story. Um, part of the fun of the, the thing is, well, as writing the book was, I was imagining it as a film made in the 1940s and casting as many people as I could in all the various roles. Obviously, because we've got Rathbone and Bruce and Hill Hudson and um, Dennis Hoey's version of Virgil Lestrade are all coming from the film. Um, but I, I kind of, as a game, was just casting everybody as well along. So uh, I, I cast Alice Fay in the role of Gail Preston, who is not as famous as she should be now, but she, she had a fantastic... Uh, uh, career in musicals and drama um, in Hollywood. But then in the 40s, she retired. She married Harris, which is very smart. She's still Harris, a band leader in comedian, and gave up this whole career to raise their family with their daughter, um, which uh, a Martha Jones character. I mean, they, they were together until their death. At the end. They were also had a family. So, and uh, seeing her in films that she, yeah, Gail is played by uh, Alice Faye. And um, Eric Bloor, who played a lot of comic roles in, in uh, 30s and 40s films, the parts of him in it. And um, all the way through it, you can find somebody for all, all the parts. Um, then you come up with the characters, they just, it, it, they just spring into mind. It's like, there's not really a method for picking characters. Um, have a, a, a somewhat slimy reporter, which is a bit unfair about it. Most of what aren't slimy this guy is. Um, and, and, and a repugnant artist turned up in it as well. And that was fun to like. I guess it's writing characters who aren't very nice are actually much more fun to write. Um, and of course, when you're writing a mystery like this, it's a matter of there should be all, lots of characters in it because they're the suspect, you know, which one of them, um, 
is, is, is the mudra and why are we doing it? So uh, you do present characters who are interesting in themselves um, and have their own kind of story to carry on. Uh, and so they seem to pop it into my head and, then, uh, <laughs> and go from there. But this is a bonus of, I will put it online at some point. I do have an entire cast list for the whole film, of every part that's been played in it. And so actor and actress, so every one of them. Uh, just because it's fun to imagine it actually being a 1940s black and white film. Um, I, I think that's all I have to say about, about the character. Well, I'm wondering too, well, with your characters, when you create your characters, um, do you have an inner monologue in your head? Can you hear your characters? I know I hear voices. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the joke, but uh, ah. how does that work for you? Oh, no, wait, yeah, well, I, I, didn't, I don't know if you guys are writers mm-hmm. here, yeah. Uh, I, I, I figure my strength as an author are um, plotting and dialogue. And I think the characters come out mainly in the dialogue, the way they speak, the things they say. Um, and so, you know, Holmes and Watson have, have a very sort of high diction. They're, they're highly educated men and still kind of old fashioned, even though they're not Victorian gentlemen. They're still, they're still, they've been to public schools and they, they have that kind of thing. Whereas, um, um, say, Inspector Lestrade, um, he's not much of a character in Conan Doyle, but Dennis Hoyes was Lestrade. He's not a common man character. And I really enjoyed writing for him. Uh, of make, giving him a, a kind of almost cockney richness to his expression. He's got lovely tons of phrase that are things that Holmes and Watson would say. And so his character comes up very much in that. And that his attitude of being not the really applauding policeman, but uh, actually a good, a good but a hard working staff at the job. And then with having um, a character of Gail, a method character, and a bit, that she of course talks in a way totally different to anybody else in, in the book. Uh, she, she has a Kind of slangy American way of talking. It was also really fun to write, especially when it's set a kind of forty um, thing there. And uh, so, so, yeah, I, I find that the, as well as a slight physical description, I think the dialogue about the characters, the things they say, you know, will really bring out another nice touch. Because you think right in this period, is, and these days everybody smokes, mm. and um, so people can you know, there's pipes and cigars and cigarettes. And that, you know, and it, it, these are great props when mm. characters are doing things. You know, you can kind of play, light a cigarette in a certain way and stub it out decisively, and that might make mm. or they can blow smoke slowly while they're thinking. And there's, there's all these things you can do with that as a prop, um, which nowadays people can't smoke in their story would be odd. Um, it would be a, a thing that would be too much. Where then, um, it's a whole thing, homes and his pipes and mm. all that. Um, are all very much part of the whole new year. And, it gives, and once again, their character expresses. Um, uh, you know, does somebody smoke cigarettes all the time? Do they have the occasional pipe in the thing? And that's it. Do they smoke big cigars? Um, and so the, the, that's a period thing that allows you to, to, to give that aspect to the character that you couldn't really do in the same way now. Now, do you have a, a, a website or a place that people can find you or find out more about your books and stuff? Um, yeah. What would um, you- at the end of every one of my books, I have a, 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 an author's afterword to explain a couple of things. At the very end, I have my website, which is www.harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, hyphen authors, A-U-T-H-O-R-S, dot com, all small case. And, um, and that has biographical information about me. It's got stuff about the book. It's got all my books listed, things about them. A few articles I've written in connection with the book. It's also got stuff about um, and my games that I've made, uh, and uh, my wife's books are featured on there as well. So um, uh, it, it, it's a treasure chest of fascinating information, which I'm still trying to add to. I, I, I've made up this cast list for uh, the, the novels, and I need to get that actually online as well. It's friends that run the website for me, so I, I have no idea how to do it. So I just send them things, and then when they've got time, they'll put them up there. I really appreciate the work they they, they do for that. Um, so yes, uh, that, that's it. Uh, you, you just go around and find me, Robert DeHara, so you'll find this on there. There's also links to a comedy podcast that I do with my friend Alan McFadden, which will be new material for now. Um, it's called Quantum Fridge. It's a comedy podcast mm. company. And we do, um, we have a fabulous cast of new comedy shows, uh, you know, science fiction and mystery and um, adventure. Uh, comedies um, that we do. It's also, there's links to that too. So anybody plunging into the Harris website will find games, comedy, novels, and, and everything your heart can desire other than whiskey and cigars. Oh, too bad. Uh, well, we'll have that actually link up to our site as well so people listening can do one copy. That'd be great. Yeah, so yeah. that's easy. And, uh... 
And nice thing too is because people can contact me through the website, and I, I really nice to go right to me and say I want to have enjoyed the book. That 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 really take the time to do that because uh, you, you don't get the direct uh, you know experience of uh, of people enjoying the book um, because you know it's kind of different. Um, I've been writing for our, our, our podcasting about we had a friend Al and I wrote a, a comedy which was uh, recorded by the, recorded by the BBC many years ago. Um, and it was a big live event, and it, it was called a play a pie and a pint. And we had a pint of beer and a scotch pie. We were watching this, this comedy we put on about moving the scotch. And it was fantastic to have written something and be sitting there in an audience that was just enjoying the hell out of it. They were laughing and cheering and like an applauding end off. Uh, and that, that's a great thing to hear. Also, um, because about my younger books, my, my books I've written for middle grade um, kids, I've done a lot of visits to schools and uh, areas. I get to put on plays with the kids and do story making sessions with them, and um, it, it's wonderful having them react. You know how much how much they enjoy it, how enthusiastic they are about about all this stuff. And so, I think when you're sitting at home by yourself writing a novel, you for grown ups, you send it out there, you don't get that kind of thing. So people do write. Um, I really appreciate that when you get in touch and they want to enjoy the book and ask for more. Luckily, as I've mentioned, um, people ask me, "Are you going to get any more of these?" Yes, it's, it's all done. Um, it's going to be coming out, well, coming out over here next year, and I'm hopefully Pegasus will be very keen to do this again. Uh, another one because it seems to go down very well over in the States, getting great reviews in major publications and, um, and getting publicity people like you that have taken interest in it, which is great. Because the worst thing for any author is to put all this, all the heart and all the talent into a book, and then it just disappears. Nobody even knows about it. It's not, nothing to do with it's good, bad, or indifferent. People don't read it because they don't hear about it. So um, you want attention for the book. So uh, I'm really glad that the concept of uh, doing a 1942 Sherlock Holmes based on the film has intrigued enough people that it's, it's actually getting quite a bit of attention. And that means people will hear about it and um, give it a try. And I hope they'll all enjoy it. They'll enjoy it tremendously. Um, that's what I want with anything else. People will read it and have a, a fantastic time reading it. So we'll just be completely absorbed in it. And we'll get to the end of all those. We'll really satisfied and um, be gasping for more because there is more. Yeah. There you go. Well, uh, we appreciate yeah. it. How was how was writing during the pandemic for you? Did it affect you at all? Not oh. much different. Because <laughs> you just yeah. in the cold. Um, you know, we were lucky. The last summer, we've, we've got a nice garden. We live in a nice neighborhood. We've got a dog. So we can take dog for walks on the beach and everything. Um, with stuff like this, we're keeping in touch online. It was really great. So you have to contact family and friends on Skype. We have weekly, uh, weekly meetings with family. Particularly with my son, um, who works in publishing too, he and I would meet uh, uh, on we have a Skype session with a few beers. We called it Man Skype. Oh. <laughs> so we were able to still, you know, have this kind of chat we normally have, and another friend of mine, we, we joined in with it too. And uh, it was just great to kind of sit around and, and do the kind of talking you do with your friends and your family. Um, it was nearly as good as actually being there, and it meant we didn't lose that. So, because uh, you didn't have contact with people. Um, and then it, we, earlier this year, we put together a bunch of writers online to, to celebrate the same Gene Owens birthday. We've got about 10 writers online together on a Zoom thing. Uh, and it's just really nice to be to stay in touch with, with other writers as well and see what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for what we do, we work at home like this. I know some people, this has been a terrible time for them, what they've had to go through. They've, they've, they're stuck in an in a, in a apartment block with four kids who can't go to school. All this it must be really, really tough. So it's been easy for us, but our kids are all growing up. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 some writers I've seen online saying, oh, I, I can't concentrate. Or, no, it didn't affect me. Um, it's been pretty soft for me. I, I, I appreciate how, how easy this has been for me to put how some people who've got difficult jobs to do and, you know, a little So it didn't really impinge, although, you know, writing about World War II, it's not the same thing, but life is restricted then uh, by rationing and blackouts and things. And the restrictions we've got now, you know, I think, well, comparatively slight, really. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we'll all be over soon. Yeah. Be over <laughs> and uh, uh, and get go do some traveling. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, it's been a great show. Thank you for coming on. Our our book today that we're talking about is a study in Crimson Sherlock Holmes, 1942, and the author was our guest, Robert J. Harris. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking interest in the, in the book. I, I hope that you, your listeners will um, go and try it out and really enjoy it. And, um, and 
be back for the next one. <laughs> I'm sure they will. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll tell you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. IKEA always asks, what makes a house a home? Comfort? Making your place your own? Hmm. Affordable solutions created with the planet in mind? With IKEA, it's all of the above. And now you can afford even more with new benefits for IKEA family members, including 5% off on all eligible purchases in store. Every visit, every day. Visit ikea-usa.com slash family to learn more and join. Offer valid starting 9 one Limited to qualifying purchases. Exclusions apply. Not valid on services. Discount applied in store only before tax, shipping, and handling. Cannot be combined with coupons. Visit ikea-usa.com slash family for more details. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi, I'm Helen Lewis, and I want to tell you about a podcast I've made for BBC Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. It's called The New Gurus, and it's about how everywhere you look on the internet, people are giving advice. Advice they claim will transform your life. Advice that gets some thousands, even millions of devoted followers. These online prophets are telling us how to eat, how to think, how to get rich, how to find love, how to manage our time. So how exactly are these gurus changing our lives and the world around us? And who holds them to account? Find out by subscribing to The New Gurus wherever you get your podcasts. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.